take number five. All right, yeah. And I want to number five. Yeah, and I'll figure that out later. This is kind of like my comedy career, right? <laughs> I'll figure that out later. That's yeah. fine. My very young one. And now I'm not going to be able to get this to stay up. Did it, it looked like that before, didn't it? Yes. Okay, cool. And it has a pretty wide frame, too, so I feel like it didn't, like... Like, there was a lot of space up and down, so even if it was a little bit off the way it was before. I'm jealous of um, video guys. I feel like... Um, I feel like we're moving... Because I'm in marketing, mm -hmm. so I feel like we're, like, in this wave where... Um, the technology has gotten to be so affordable. Yes. And you could do a lot with so little. Mm -hmm. Whereas back, I mean, just 20 years ago, you would have had to go to some major production school. You'd have to meet the right people um, and then get a, like a lucky break mm -hmm. to be able to distribute your work. Right. But now you have like YouTube and stuff, you can just bounce it wherever or whatnot. And I keep hearing these interviews because like I like listening to interviews and people are just like, am I, are you picking me up? Yeah, I think you're top. Yeah, you're top. I'm top? Mm -hmm. Okay, boom. I think you register more when you talk directly. Into so it. I'll like look at YouTube, I'll be this way. <laughs> I feel like this is, I don't even know what this is like, but it's cool. It's good. I like it. I like it. But no, you like, I listen to all these like film like podcasts that was like, oh, you can make this movie with just like iPhone and stuff. And that's what yeah. you need. And really it's like. The quality of it's so good, especially with a lot of these phones now, like the iPhone and like the Google, whatever the Google phones are. Yeah. They just look really nice too. So if you're like a low budget, just trying to shoot something, um, be it for like a you know audition reel or just trying to get whatever you wrote, just to be on visual, you just have the access really easily instead of having to go and buy a camera. I mean, if you're techy enough, you can obviously get that whenever you want to. But you know, what do you use for your editing? Uh, I'm a Premiere baby. I love mm. the Adobe Creative Suite. That's what yeah. my school taught me. I went to for people who don't know, I went to Kent State. Uh, so I went to Kent State, they taught uh, Adobe Premiere, they also taught Avid, but I never took those classes just because Avid scares me. Avid, I've never heard of it. Avid, it's like a, I don't even know how to describe it, it's just like a different editing system and it's like a lot more complicated than uh, what you would find somewhere else. So it's just a very, it's a very more complex version of what Adobe is. Adobe is more, I would say more user friendly. For stuff. So that's what I know. Um, for an internship I've had to use I movie one time and I was like, this is gross. I movie is gross. Well, I mean, after like you like taking taking like classes and stuff and know sort of what you're looking yeah. for, it's kind of like, oh, this is like basic. <laughs> I came and like, I have to like get, do their cross phase. What if I want to like shorten it down? Or, you know, it's weird. So you didn't start college pursuing video, right? No, no. I started off musical theater. Because I was like, I wanted to do musical. I, I, I knew I wanted to perform since I was a kid. I'd done theater camps since I was a kid. And I thought, oh, the next logical step is musical theater. And I was like, I'm just going to pursue this. It's going to be awesome. I love singing and dancing. It sort of fits my personality. Um, is it picking me up? Yeah, it's it's picking you up. It, it's picking you up best when you're looking that way. Mm -hmm. Maybe, is there is there a way we could No, yeah, we, for sure. We could just do that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's less weird, uh -huh. I feel like. This is part of the podcast. <laughs> this is it. This is the pod. I mean, you can edit whatever you want. This yeah. is like, this is the soul of the podcast right here. Trying to figure out where the bike placement is. Um, but yeah, I wanted to do musical theater because I was, in, I like love the music and stuff. And I'm corny like how most musical theater is. So I was like, oh, this is perfect. You know, it sort of fits that mantra. And I, I was, uh, I ushered that play out square actually. I was uh, one of the student ushers. So I would work in those uh, Broadway shows and I would be there as like a student usher and I could see those shows for free. And so I just sort of deep dive into like that culture and everything and I was like, oh, this is it. Then I got to, to pursuing it in school and I was, um, it turned into one of those things like, oh, this isn't for me. Like it's great and stuff. I love this, this sort of art form, but it doesn't love me back in the sort of way that I thought it would. Uh, the skills that I thought I was gonna be able to gain, I did not gain. It was just sort of like restrictions of myself that I just like didn't foresee myself, you know, envisioning. So it was just one of those things that just didn't work. It just didn't work out. And then I started working uh, with a program at Kent State called TV2. And uh, that's where they have like their whole like broadcast sort of thing for news. But that's has an entertainment section where I worked on a sketch comedy show. And I was like, oh, this is it. 
this is, this is what I really want to do. So I figured that out like halfway through like my sophomore year. Yeah, I, I switched my major too. What was I, your major? My major, I started with marketing okay. and I couldn't pass accounting 101. Oh, you have to get accounting with yeah. marketing? Yeah, so I, I, took, I took it twice and I failed. Okay. And then I, I went to where all of the um, football players go, <laughs> communications. Yeah. And you just, you just. <laughs> well, that's typically what I, I mean, with the, the film program I was in, was in the school of uh, CCI, communication information. So I guess I technically did the same thing too. Yeah. I feel like that's sort of like, it's either business or communications where people go and they don't know what they want to do. Yeah, exactly. It's like sort of the default area. Yeah, and we all know it and we can mm -hmm. all feel it. Can you tell the difference between marketing and advertising is? Um, advertising is a component component of marketing. Okay. So, um, all all marketers do marketing, but not all marketers do advertising. Okay. So, for example, I'm a marketer. Mm -hmm. I'm in marketing, but I my discipline is social media. Right. Whereas someone who does an ad for the local news, mm -hmm. their their discipline is advertising. Right. So they're an advertiser, and I'm a digital marketer, mm -hmm. right? But we're both marketers. We're both in marketing. Okay. And that's the difference. They're so close, though. They're like so like. I feel like they're like cousins to each other. Like they almost like bridge on the same area. Well, I mean, so if you're if you're in advertising, you're in marketing. Mm -hmm. But um, just because you're in marketing doesn't mean you're in advertising. Okay. So it's like, like marketing's the big umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like um, humans or mammals. Yes. But then we're homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. So like in this scenario, in a business sense, marketing is kind of like the, the grouping, the, uh, uh, the mammal part. Okay. And then the advertising is the homo sapiens part, to so, be more specific. So humans are marketing and, and uh, whales are, are advertising. <laughs> right? Is that what you're saying? I, I guess. I feel like whales are so, they're, they're much more glorious than humans. Sort of like how advertising was a more glorious than marketing. Yeah, but every advertising is marketing. Okay. So you can't have... You can't have advertising without marketing. I eat like a whale. Does that count? <laughs> I have a really big appetite. Really? I mean, I have a I have a big appetite too. Like people I, are very confused when they see me. people. And people who know me, like they know I can like slam a pizza, like a whole pizza by myself. That used to be my thing. That used to be my talent when I was a kid. I'd be like Jordan would eat this whole pizza by himself. Watch, and I'd just go in and with no problem go up. You know, do kid stuff, run around and stuff. Like wow, he like ate that whole pizza. Now I feel sluggish and my bowels don't feel great. Yeah, what is that? Like, is it, is it, did it some, did something happen to your body? Does something happen to your body when you get older? Or do you, are you just so dumb when you're a kid <laughs> that you can't even realize that it's really messing up your whole day? I don't know. I just, I guess like just like my energy is going down because I'm just I'm doing more. Because what was I doing when I was a kid? Yeah. Besides going to besides maybe going to school and then doing mm -hmm. homework and then running around acting a fool. That makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Like on vacation, I can like sleep for like four hours. Yeah. And then I feel charged mm -hmm. because I'm not doing anything. Right. Right. And I, I it, when I think about it, I don't do anything anyway. It's like mm -hmm. I get paid to sit down and tap my fingers yeah. on a piece of plastic and metal. Well, it's all like mental. All those, I think yeah. like the stuff we do is all mental stuff. It's like yeah. not like anything physical we're doing. It's like that mental exhaustion and that all connects. And when you're mentally exhausted, everything's exhausted. Isn't that crazy though? Yeah. Like yeah. there's no movement going on with this. Like mm -hmm. if you were to like pan behind the laptop, you just see my fingers doing this. I always like to think like, the, like the aliens like looking down is what they're doing. I'm like, what is he doing? Just start tapping on the screen. Like, what is he doing? Yeah. Like, what is he even like? This is not even like registering. Like I don't understand. It would, Do something. It, it's so confusing, man. I it's was, like I, I I like tap these like pieces of plastic mm -hmm. and I stare at a piece of glass that shines. I know. I like staring at a laptop computer and just call people all day and just ask them if they want to have this insurance. I, <laughs> I know they don't want to have to give two rebuttals even though I don't want to give two rebuttals. <laughs> so yeah, talk to me about that, man. Do, do you feel like working at a call center has helped you as a communicator? It, it actually has. And it helps me because 
the biggest thing is because I in my life am not I have not been very aggressive aggressive person. I'm very much like I just want to go with the flow and make people happy and stuff. And that's fine for most things. I'm like making friends and stuff. I'm very good at adapting to different places. But when I need to be assertive, I'm not that great at it. This job, I realize I've only been here for two weeks, so I'm not like an expert or anything. But I just noticed like my assertiveness and me not being afraid to be assertive um, is just starting to come out more because when I'm like I need to make this, I want and my goal is to try to get appointments, but also just to sort of help for some of the area managers who are selling insurance to get some appointments. And so sometimes what I've noticed is that sometimes the initial just like call of like, hey, we, you know, we have this insurance thing, we're getting contact with our area managers. They're like, oh, well, I don't want that. I have to get sort of past that, you know, because I'll be like, I'm the person that's like, if they don't like, if they're like, no, I don't want it. Like, oh, no, sorry. But sometimes it's sort of like that extra, it's the right extra push and sort of find that line between like being assertive and just being overbearing. Yeah. So sort of finding that, it's made me more confident in knowing when, how much more I can push. Yeah, I think I like that term, the the right extra push. The right extra push. There's sometimes it's like, come on, you want to get this. You know you want to get this. Come on, you know you want this. You really want this. And like, I did that once having a call. Not exactly that, but I pushed a little bit too far. And he's like, and the guy on the phone was like, no, what part of no don't you understand? <laughs> we call it all from parts of the country. So he has an accent. It's like, what part of no don't you understand? I get it. I don't want, he was really nice up until that point, but I pushed him too far, I'm like, okay, that's the line. Yeah. I don't want to cross. <laughs> that's it. How, what would you say the percentage of calls that you make of the, the, the person on the other line thinking that you're a white person? All the time. Listen, <laughs> I was just telling my coworker about the other day. It's all the time. I was calling somebody in the South. It was like a Confederate organization or something. Like it, said, it said something Confederate, I'm like, oh no. It is, it's like they're gonna tell I'm black and they're gonna be like, oh man, who is this? But I was talking to the phone, like, oh, like, oh yeah, no, oh, oh my gosh, you're so nice, sir. I'm like, do they know I'm black? He says Confederate on it. So I'm just like, oh, do you know <laughs> That's who you're talking to? That's beautiful. It's probably all the time because I, I joke about this when I do comedy and stuff. I have a very, just like, very formal, very precise voice that you don't hear yeah. typically from many African Americans. I'm doing quotations, people can't see me. I'm realizing this. Well, they can. Well, they can now. Wow. <laughs> kind of, maybe. First of all, hold on. Before I continue, I love this, like, podcast banter. This has been, like, on my bucket list ever since I listened to the podcast. Nice. It's like that initial, like, podcast, like, getting to know each other sort of stuff. Yes. Like, having fun. We, we know we're on the mic. You know, we're sort of talking and stuff. Just, yeah. I just want, I Thanks want for coming on the podcast. No man. problem. I it. I like, I, listen, I love podcasts, and that's, listen, if I can just, there are certain things that I can just do the rest of my life and be happy with. Like, podcasts are one of those things. Listening or recording? Both. I can listen to recorded podcasts all day. How how many podcasts have you recorded? Uh, only a couple in school. Yeah, I've done uh, three episodes. Was it super scripted? It was not. This? No, no, no. It was not super scripted. It was we were talking about nerd stuff, film things, mm. and so it was just basically because it was for like a the film program that we have. They have their own organization that had a podcast talking about like stuff that's happening in like you know entertainment media and stuff like that. So nice. it was just like, oh, we just pop talk about Arrow one day, and then I always talk about The Bachelor, and people know I'm going to watch The Bachelor and stuff. So I was like, throw that stuff in. And it's just, uh, I like talking anyways. I like talking to people. Yeah. That's like my other skill set besides every, everything I went to school with that I have acquired on my own that I feel confident in. Mm-hmm. So like anytime I get to use that, I feel like, oh, man, I'm not a terrible, can't-do-nothing person. Yeah, so you said something that stuck out to me when you were talking about your earlier days as a would, would you call yourself a thespian yes yes so your earlier days you said that the theater and, and, and you said it more articulately than i'm going to say but you said the theater didn't love you back the mm-hmm. way that you thought you yeah. were going to be loved back can you like walk me through that what do you mean by that well a lot of, a lot of my ways of form of thinking this is why i like listening to podcasts because people are explaining these sort of things and it's like oh that clicks for me and I was listening to an episode the other day. It was with Pete Holmes and uh, Hassan Minaj. They were doing like an interview together. And then Hassan was talking about his doing his stand-up. He was talking about um, how he was doing stand-up. His stand didn't love him back. And the way that the traditional stand-up wasn't his route until he found like Daily Show and stuff. And I've been trying to process it ever since I left the major. Why it wasn't completely working out. Why I lost the drive. Why I wasn't um, doing as well as I thought it was. And it was just one of those things where it was like, his explaining of that is where I got that from. And so that's why I say it now. It's sort of the best way where it's like, um, 
you know, I, I, it's not that I didn't try my best, I did. And it's not that I didn't want it, I did. It just didn't, it's just, it just wasn't the right form for me. So when I say that, I just mean that theater wasn't my outlet that I once thought it was. It was more of like a gateway to get where I eventually wanted to go, where I sort of am right now, trying to do more stand up, stand up than anything else. But it was one of those things like it got me into the performance game, got mm. me into understanding the, the, the value of like, you know, story and, uh, mm. you know, my physical presence and, you know, talk, uh, interacting with people on stage and having that stage presence. Yeah. It got me to that point. Um, for one thing that I struggled with when I was a music theater major, it's my voice. I, I have a, people tell me I have a nice voice, and so I thought I could write on that. Um, I have a very limited range of where I can sing, mm. and it gets showed. Because for every role that I think that I wanted to perform, because the big thing with you have to find your own rep and stuff. But when you go in auditions, as I find the, the roles that you could play and find roles that already exist that, that sort of fit into that tap. Any role that I wanted to play, it's just right outside of my vocal limit. Because I'm like mm -hmm. a baritone bass, more on the baritone side. Um, but a lot of them are going to be baritone tenor or just tenor. And stuff. my voice only goes to a certain point. So I had a lot of vocal insecurity. And then also, when I was in the program, I had a lot of anxiety that I hadn't really explored yet, that had been like throughout my whole life. And so it was one of those things where it's like I couldn't get past my anxiety enough to break out of the, just to try something new or get over out of my own head. And the program, the the program at Kent State, it's a great program. It's just for me, I need to be at a different, I need to be at a different headspace. And I wasn't at that headspace for that, mm. for that sort of area. And I, at some point, realized I wasn't going to get out of that headspace in that program. Not because it wasn't yeah. good, it just wasn't what I needed at that so, point. So do you feel like when you were talking about like this anxiety and not being able to get out of your own head, mm -hmm. do you, do, it, it, it kind of makes me think that there was a, a headspace that you had to reach where it was almost as if you were embodying a different persona. Yeah. And, and like you're up there, you're acting, but in 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 the back of your mind, you're like, well, I'm Jordan, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And what you're saying is the next level is actually leaving what is considered to be Jordan. Well, more I think it's more of like combining what is Jordan and what is the character and what is what the character is. That's sort of like the Stanislavski method is bringing, or was the acting method, acting method that I have started to learn is like bringing yourself into the character. And making them sort of one person. Okay. So it's not necessarily yourself, but it's not absent of yourself. Okay, per se. that's interesting. You're not leaving yourself. You're putting yourself into a different sort of situation. Mm -hmm. Like you're putting yourself in that area. And I couldn't get my whole self over into that one area through that own format. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, that, I learned. I, I did a little bit of theater. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I grew up in the church, and we had a passion play every year. Oh, we okay. actually had, like, we had, like, three different plays. I think we had a cri Christmas play. Mm -hmm. We had a passion play. And then, like, we had something else, like, just scattered throughout the year. Mm -hmm. But um, my grandfather w was the head pastor of wow, the church. Okay. So, like, he, he, gave, he always would give me something to do. Mm -hmm. And I started, like, I was on stage crew, you know, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. like, showing up in all black with a, with a flashlight at, like, seven. Mm -hmm. So um, I did that until I was, like, in my teens. And then I didn't do anything until I was, like, a junior or I think it was my senior year right. of high school that I was actually in mm -hmm. my school's play. And uh, I feel like that's kind of helped me with stage presence. Oh, of course. I, I'm a, whenever I'm, a, I'm really interested in something, I go deep dive into it. I can't think about anything else. I have to learn everything else everything else about it. So like with, uh, initially when I was in theater, it was like researching every sort of thing that I could do. Like musical theater, I was all in that. Like just learning more and more and more. And that's sort of how um, I sort of got in that. And sort of was learning sort of more of that terminology. Also through being um, a major in that for a year and a half is sort of like more deep diving to like sort of like what it takes. And that's sort of, when I knew more about it is when how I knew that I wasn't going to be able to make it in there, and that sort of thing. And oddly enough, that was around the time, was it around the time, or maybe it was a year later, that I started doing stand-up. Because one of those things that I realized that I had this big anxiety that was over me, and I started to address it more and stuff. And it was like sort of like unbearing these sort of things that it's like, oh, like, well, why do I feel the, the, this sort of way? What is this actually rooted in? Is it rooted more of like an actual like sort of fear, or is it more of just like, um, my, what am I saying? Like, is it actually rooted in some base here, or is it just stuff in my head that I'm building up for myself? Am I building up something 
inside of myself that's like preventing me from doing other things. So I had to really break that down. And in order for me to do that, I had to sort of get out of that atmosphere where I, where I need to unveil that completely just because I wasn't at that space yet. Mm-hmm. And when I actually did do that, I'm like, I realized, like, oh, this just wasn't for me in the long run, which is perfectly okay, you know? And when I started to unveil that, that's when I started doing stand-up, actually. So then I'm always interested, if you don't mind me asking you a question, this is your podcast, so can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. When did you start doing stand-up? I did, I started last February. Okay, so this is a pretty recent thing for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, February, I think it was February 12th, 2018. Okay. Yeah. So what got you wanting to do stand-up? Well, I mean, there, there's, and I, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but there's like, uh, there's a couple of different variables that, that took place. I used to stay up and watch Cat Williams mm-hmm. and uh, Bernie Mac. How old were you? Oh, man, I was so young. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was so young. And I'd be, like, mesmerized mm-hmm. by them. And I loved it. I loved watching stand-up specials. I would, was, the funny thing is when I was, I think, I had to have been around 8 or 10. I remember this very clearly. It was Chris Rock's Kill the Messenger. I was watching that with my parents. Which is not okay. Because anyone who's heard Chris Rock at that time, he's like raunchy as all outdoors. I don't know yeah, why. Right. I was like, knowing my parents wouldn't let me read Harry Potter. I don't know why they let me listen to. The, that's that's weird. That's strange. That, that they would let me watch uh, Kill the Messenger. But I just remember just him being up there, and that was a show where he would do. They did. They took different shows from different cities. He was wearing a different outfit each time. Mm. They did one from New York, one in Atlanta, and then one in London. That he was doing, I think Atlanta was the right city, and he would just go cut back and forth. He had this sort of energy, and and then also like it was just like watching that, and it was just like oh, yeah, it's just this whole other thing. I'm like that's not, that's not a real thing. Mm. For the longest time, it was like that's not a real thing. That's just a very thing select few get to do. And I'm like, yeah. And after a while, I was like, for at least, you know, at least for me, I was like wow, like why, like why can't I do that? Mm-hmm. So what was it what was it like for you when you were like, I want to do stand up. Well, so I think, like, the next step was being in high school, and I really focused in on sports and not mm-hmm. so much on art. And I remember I was, like, a junior in high school, and I went to some house party with my friends. And now it's kind of weird that I think about it because it was, like, a high school, like, house party. Mm-hmm. But then, like, at some point we all gathered around the TV and sat around and watched it, which is weird. Those are the best parties, though. I mean, yeah, yeah. And at that time, it was Kevin Hart. I forget oh. I forget which special he had just dropped in. Mm-hmm. But I was spending more time looking at the people watching him than I was watching him. That's the funny thing I noticed about comedians. Like, we always want to see how people are reacting with this sort of thing. Yeah. But, like, we can care. Like, I don't know. I was just thinking, like, it was, like the jokes are funny, and that's, that's cool. I always laugh more at other people laughing, and I always like get a kick out of other people enjoying something rather than I do actually actually out of the comedy. Mm-hmm. And I guess that sort of comes from just that one of make wanting to make people laugh and wanting to know what makes people laugh. Yes. So that's something I've noticed for myself too, which is mm-hmm. interesting. Which is interesting. I was like, I wonder if I'm the only one that feels like this. Yeah. So I was like observing them, and I was just so I was so blown away that this one person mm-hmm. could captivize and like change the energy and the environment. And for like an hour. Yeah. Just a whole hour of just him just talking. Yeah. So then jump forward to, I know this is drawn out, jump forward to uh, college. I started dating my now wife and uh, we'd be ne- Netflix and chilling. Mm-hmm. And I would be like, hey, do you want to watch this special or whatever? And she said no. I was like, what? She was like, yeah, I don't really like stand-up. And to, to, to me, like, that never even registered. It, it didn't even register that someone couldn't like stand-up. That's crazy to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um... How'd you get past it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, she, she makes me a better person. Well, that's good. You know, okay. she holds me to a high standard, and it's really forced me to become a better individual well, that's, I mean if you like just broke up with her just because it was like oh you don't like stand up that's yeah. like the, that's something I would have done <laughs> younger me that's you don't so like stand up this can't work and yeah. that, that's like an immaturity thing anyway yeah but I what I think I recognized was like obviously art is subjective mm-hmm. right uh, my friend Nick Hartman who I've had on this podcast before um, he's a musician and he, he's he told me and I think he might have changed this we went to high school together but he told me that there's no such thing as bad music 
Mm. There's just music that you don't like. I agree with that. I've always thought about that because I've always thought about like people in their taste and stuff. Yeah. It's like, well, how can I not like this one thing yeah. and everyone else loves it mm. and no one else liked this one thing, but I love it. It all has to be like whatever. It's all like internal. Nothing's external, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's and all an internal thing and it's, it is based off of like a whole ring thing, like culture, race, uh, background, just sort yeah. of like where you're at in your life right now too. And it was so polarizing to me uh -huh. to like, it, it made me realize that, oh, I really like this, mm -hmm. right? When when someone wasn't really about it, yeah. it made me realize that, oh, well, there's some people that are really into it, right, and I'm right. one of those people. So I tossed around the idea of trying to do stand-up for like years and years and years. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked my mom, I love my mom, I'm a mama's boy. Mm -hmm. um, she, uh, she, what I love about her is she's always honest with me. And that's how I see love. Yeah. I recognize love when someone thinks that I'm capable of hearing something that I don't want to hear, mm -hmm. right? And that's the that's a crowd. Yeah, right. That's, that, a crowd. that's, that, a crowd. That, that, that's a crowd. So like that's how I see love. And that's also like your first audience too. Like you probably yeah. make your mom. Yeah. You probably get kicked out making your mom and, laugh. And and that's what I asked my mom was like, hey mom, do you think I could do stand up? And she was like, I think you're funny, but I don't think you're that kind of funny. Okay. So it was like you know, popping a balloon and letting the, the helium out. But anyways, uh, fast forward to um, when I move up here to Cuyahoga Falls, mm -hmm. the fall of 2017, I had just gotten married. Uh, I had brought some friends up from Youngstown to hang out with me. Yeah, yeah. And my friend Ryan Davenport, who I've also had on this podcast, mm -hmm. he looks just like me. We went to high school together. Okay. <laughs> and he looks just like me. It's it's creepy. Like, we did a face swap. And it's just the same. And it's yeah, it was, the same. It was the same. <laughs> I love that. But, and, but he's way funnier than me. He's like the funniest mm -hmm. person in our group of friends. Right. And all of our friends, we were trying to get him to do stand-up because he didn't know what he wanted to do right. uh, at, at that point. And I was like, I was like, dude, he 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 texted the, the group chat, the funny stop, mm -hmm. and he's like, hey Lou, there's a club down the street from your house. Oh, so and, he like let you know about the and, funny. Well, stop. I knew about it, but I pretended like I didn't know about like, it. Yeah. You were not. <laughs> they were like, all I can do is just like <laughs> funny stop. That's that. Yeah, exactly. You know, the secret that you're researching is the like, <laughs> like, like, had all the cues like maybe yeah, you go here, but maybe yeah, not. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I don't know about that. So so then I saw the opportunity. I was like, hey. I, if you go and do a set, I will go do a set. And uh, he, we put a date on the calendar. Mm -hmm. um, it was like a month out, so I'm just writing and writing and writing as much as I could. And I wanted to go up clean because I have a job that has a 401k mm -hmm. and I'm married. So I didn't want to out the gate just be outrageous. Yeah. So I just start, I started clean. We go in there and we're like, hey, we're here for the amateur night. Pete yells at us, and, and and some food comes out of his mouth during during <laughs> his speech that you know we can't go because we didn't call in. Oh, and uh, but there was like nobody there, and there was like <laughs> there was like four comics, and uh, he let us on. And he told us he's like, you get five minutes, and you got to be clean. Mm -hmm. My friend didn't have any clean material. Oh no, and so he he backed out. What does he mean by? When he says clean, does he mean like just like no cussing or no f bombs? No f bombs. Yeah. Okay. No f bombs and be easy on the vulgar stuff. Okay. You know, and so I went up and I, I did the set. It was okay, mm -hmm. and it was kind of like it was it was like a weight was lifted off my back because I could now die knowing that I I at least tried it. Right. And I've been going back ever since. But in the meantime, going back to you know be clean. Um, when we got off the stage, Pete was telling us that you got to start clean. Yeah, I've heard him and, say that. And before. he said, he, he, it took me about a year for me to realize what he meant by this. Mm -hmm. He said, nobody's going to book you when you're clean. And if you, if you get to 15 clean minutes of material, when you feature, and you add, you add cussing into it, he's like, it will jump to 30. 
and you wanted to write any any new jokes. Oh, uh, it's one of those things where it's like you start off with the bear, like you get good at the bear, and then add the juices on, like add like all the extra stuff on to you. Exactly. Like you gotta make the cake first before you put on the frosting. Exactly, and it took me about a year for me to realize this: mm. that one, you gotta look at it from a business perspective. Okay. You know, in a sense, we're contractors. I was, right. I was telling my wife about this, like when 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 I go host at the Funny Stop. People think that I work at the Funny Stop. Right. You know what I mean? They, literally after the show, they ask me, where's this? Can I do this? Where can I find that? Blah, blah, blah. They think that I work there. Right. So in a sense, I'm a contractor on behalf of the club. You're a professional. Okay. So when, you, when you're when you just starting out as an amateur, you don't have much material. Mm -hmm. You have maybe five or ten minutes. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you don't have an audience. So if you come in and you're trying to sell your service to mm -hmm. a, a club owner or a booker, they're, that's what they're looking at. Right. They're looking at someone that doesn't have an audience and that doesn't have a lot of material. So from their perspective, turn it around on their perspective. Do they want to book someone that doesn't have an audience that might be risky in the way of offending people? Yeah. Or... Or are they more willing to book someone who has potential and has a low risk of offending the, cu the I customers? I have never thought that like that. Okay, because I've always given to the zeitgeist of just being like, I have to be real, honest, raw, and trying to tap into that part of me, which is all pretty, pretty valid. Yeah. And I was like, I just, I feel, I felt like for a while, I spent so much of my life being afraid of cussing. Mm. For in my mind, it is afraid of like sort of that more vulgar stuff that I've stayed away for it out of fear. Mm -hmm. So I've been approaching, I've been trying to approach it more in my set as a place of like me trying to come in reconciliation with like unleashing that sort of part of my brain. Well, but looking at it from yeah, that perspective, yeah. as like a business perspective, I can feel better about having um, maybe my, like having a balance between the two, I should say. Like, not giving all the way into like the, the squeaky clean, but not mm -hmm. also like diving deep into like the, the vulgar yeah. stuff. Well, let me ask you this, from, from the creator perspective, do you have a different mentality when you're writing or building your set when you know that you're gonna go to the funny stop versus when you're gonna go to Water Street Tavern? Yes, actually, and it's actually funny, one of my jokes that I wrote for Funny Stop. When he mentioned this all, I'm starting to make sense. And, and shout out to Anthony Savant, by the way. I, I love, love Anthony. He no, listen. Okay, we're gonna do a real shout out to Anthony Savant. He's the one that like kept encouraging me to do open mics and stuff. Because without that, I would have just. I I did my first set when I was 21. The no, I was like a couple. It was a little bit before 21, like a month before. I did my first set, so it was like almost two years ago. Um, I did it, and I was like, okay, this is great. I was doing it once. Anthony was like, hey, you should come to Water Street. I'll put you on. And we get became Facebook friends. And he would message me initially, like, hey, do you want to come out and do a set? He would, like, actively encourage me. And I'd be, like, so nervous. Sometimes I would deny him. But he would, like, still persistently, like, yeah. ask me and stuff. And now I can't get enough of it. And so I'm, like, I have Anthony to thank for, like, starting off, like, my comedy jump stream. Because sometimes it takes those people in your life to just encourage you. Yeah, so sure. huge shout-out to Anthony Savat. But but from the from the creative perspective, mm -hmm. you know, giving that example of, like, funny stop versus a bar gig. Yeah. Right? The way I look at it is when you put when you put those boundaries around your creativity, mm -hmm. it allows you to drive. It gets you it, more. It makes you more creative. It, it because you you know you know where you're going. It, mm -hmm. I liken it to being on the highway, and you yeah. you know the guardrails here, right? Mm -hmm. The the lines here. Yeah, and then your car is here. And all you're doing is going into a specific exactly. direction. And that's all you have to focus on. Right. And one, for one of my jokes that I do, I do a joke about say about how I can't say the N-word. Yeah. And, and and I used to just say the N-word, but I used to say it in a weird way. It'd be all pretty funny. I did it at the funny stop and just knowing I couldn't go and say the N-word because we want to keep it clean. I want to respect that. So I replaced saying the N-word with Tigga. I thought about that. I was like, okay, I could just say Tigga. Because I want to think of something that rhymes with that's yeah. fun. It's like, who doesn't love Tigger from uh, Winnie the Pooh? Yeah. And it creates like a weird visual in the head. That's so about funny. It. But then I realized, and I did it again, like, um, the night I saw you, I forget where you were in Akron, where I got your number and stuff. Oh, I think, where was that? I don't remember. It was somewhere East Akron. Yeah. But I did it again, and I said the N-word because I wasn't at the funny stop. 
then I realize the joke is funnier when I don't say the N word. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm saying I don't sound right saying the N word, I don't even go anywhere near it. So it was one of those things, like what you were saying, like the the, the boundary sort of mm -hmm. brings that sort of creativity. Yeah, and then it forces you mm -hmm. to actually find funny material. Yeah, like if I hadn't done that, I would have found the ticket, which is way funnier than me just saying the N word. Yeah. And now I can do that joke for my mom. Exactly, and that's great when you, <laughs> when you know it's like universal. Right? Yeah, like that. That's powerful. I'm gonna start going with the philosophy. I want to write so my mom can watch because mm. like that's sort of a philosophy. Because I feel so bad because my mom. There was one time I was doing a set at school, and my mom works at the university I went to school for, and she was like, "Oh, I want to come see your set." I'm like, "No, no, 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 yeah. please, please, no. There's too much." Yeah. Yeah. So and, and now I guess. I, I guess I'm starting to feel more comfortable with the aspect like I want to write so my mom can see and that's a noble it is it's noble because it's like you know I love, and, and it's I so love my mom I want her to see me and it's stuff. so hard and it's hard man. because I want to be it's honest so but like yeah. it's like honesty because that I have to sort of find that balance but and, no and have those uh, boundaries do make my creativity better like better and that's a perfect example of one one of my jokes that's worked the best and that's because of that yeah and I, I think like I think we we have shared kind of like a similar path, and I want to be honest and I want to be true. Mm -hmm. And what I think when I think of myself at my most honest and I'm at my most truest, I think of when I'm hanging out with that friend that I was telling mm -hmm. you about, right? But that friend has way, 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 way more data on who I am mm -hmm. and 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 where I come from and what we've done together, right. that the context is completely different yeah. from someone who paid money to go see someone mm -hmm. for the first time that they've never heard. It's like what mom says, you're a brand. You're a brand. You have to sort of start yeah. marketing yourself. You have to figure out what your brand is. Yeah, so... And that's one of the things I love about stand-up. You get to versus theater. In theater, you sort of like fit things that are adjacent to your brand. You find things that you fit. So like, uh, I'm like... If I'm more of like this leading man, I could play like a what's a theater guy, the Beast, and being the Beast, being like Transformers and stuff, or like the, the main guy from Billy Meyer Miller. You get sort of those roles, but in stand up, you take sort of your your own personality, you heighten it, you get a chance yeah. to get you at your ground level and just make that face it, make that into a character, yeah. rather than find, trying to find characters that sort of yep. adjacent to who you are, exactly, you get sort of match, trying to figure out like a like trying to fit into like a, a box puzzle piece. That's a good point. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about was story. And um, one of the things that I've realized as of late is that some of the people that I've come across, it might not be everyone. Mm -hmm. It might be like a regional thing. It might be something that's just with like my friends and my family. But the, the concept of story mm -hmm. or of narrative is underrated. Like when, when I talk to people and I tell them, everything's a story mm -hmm. they look at me like they're surprised and they're like what does that mean or when 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 i talk about uh religious texts like the i Bhagavad, was about to say that like, like the Bhagavad Gita, or mm -hmm. uh i would say uh the Tao, the book of the way it's really not not a lot of storytelling it's more direct mm -hmm. but then fast forward to the bible right i was thinking about that and i'm i'm checking out a book after I leave here called The Power of Myth uh, that sort of dives into the sort of because I've been there I, I talk about Pete Holmes a lot because he's sort of like the, com, the, the guy I'm into right now and he has this book that came out called Comedy Sex God and he talks about a book that he read called The Power of Myth that takes religion and sort of like because we, I think with so much time with religion what he's mentioned is that we take it to more of like a concept of like it just it's the stories and it's like taking it at a literal level yeah. rather than the story and the story being a metaphor for what is the unknown and what is what we don't know yes. for religion a lot and that's sort of the thing and that's sort of like how stories like what you're mentioning story is the basis for all of that story is the most important thing and if anything that I've experienced throughout my whole like artistic career like bouncing things and things and things it's story story is the most important mm -hmm. uh, take it to like when I was in choir it's like we always have these talks in high school about how um, if you were just singing songs and notes this is a whole chorus but no the song has a story there's like a whole build up and a climax and then a declining action built to the language of music. And I was a musical theater major. 
um, we talked about it, and the school was really good about this, not just saying this so that you sound great or you like are a powerhouse, but you are getting to the story. It, it, it's musically written to tell a story. No matter how good or bad the piece is, you can make any bad piece good by knowing the story mm -hmm. and letting that story come through. Heck, you don't even have to have the greatest voice ever. If you're indicating story, person like, wow, it's really telling the story. You may not have the best voice ever. You can you go through story and then translating it back to when I started working in, in film more. It's like a lot of things where student films fall in. It's like it looks great, it's shot great, um, edited beautifully, but there's no story. Story is the basis for everything, and you can have great visuals, great everything. If it's not based on a good story, then why am I watching it? And that, that's why I think it's underrated. It is underrated. Because it's like too close to people's face. Mm -hmm. We take it for granted. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only thing that I've realized. Like when I, when I started doing film, I started noticing all the correlations between everything I learned everywhere else. It's like story is that main thing that sort of drives. And that's sort of the rationalization why I have where I'm like, why am I even doing anything in entertainment to begin with? Like, why do I spend time? Why do I want to do this as a career? Not a lie. I'm like, oh, because story is a part of our way that we operate. Be it from beginning of the Bible to watching things to come on TV. We sort of live on story, telling stories, watching stories, being involved in stories, finding things that create memories, finding a photo that tells a story. It's all based in that story mode. And us trying to figure out a way to make the story, to, to live with those stories and have that carry go on days or distract us or something like that. It's a big part of who we are. So it is underrated because it's so personal to us and we don't even it is so close to our face that we don't even see how it affects our whole life and stuff. So Yes. And does does that tie in directly into you personally having this desire to have some type of creative output? Because I know that you mentioned when you were about a year and a half into college and you started to realize that the theater route wasn't the outlet for mm -hmm. that. So I think that statement is kind of like assuming that you need something to get out, right? <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, yeah. So what is that? Um, I mean, I just, I don't know. I always just see myself as somebody, as a performer. And I've known that for a while. I've known myself as somebody who likes being on front of the, being on stage or in camera of some capacity. I like performing. I see myself in a career in just entertainment in some capacity. I didn't know that for a while since I was in middle school. It's just in what capacity that is. It, I didn't, it, it's just all the avenues that are open to me. It just seemed like, at least especially for this area, this area has a big obsession with musicals for some reason. I don't know what it is. Isn't that strange? It is strange. Because we're like... It, I was talking to my friend Brian Alls, who I had on the podcast. Mm -hmm. He moved to Columbus. Yeah. And I told him, like, Columbus is too clean for me. Like, it, it, it feels like someone's trying to trick me. That's like Ohio. Yeah. And, 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 and like, being from Northeast Ohio, mm -hmm. it, we're in the Rust Belt, right? Yeah. And I was like, the best way to describe us is, like, we're, like, some type of, like, country urban people. We are country urban people. Like, in the town... <laughs> The town where I grew up in, I grew up in like, I wouldn't say all white, but it's like predominantly a white area mm -hmm. and stuff. And so it's a combination between like the very rich white people and then also the very not rich white people on yeah. two opposite spectrums on the same side. And there's me just like trying to go to a good school, quote unquote, good school in a, in a, in a nice area, that sort of thing. So it's that sort of like weird just combination of everything and you have like so many different extremes like you can go to Cleveland and have this whole city vibe and then go like an hour the other way and just be in cornfields yeah it's, it's strange it's very funny so but it like and we're we're, like, we're kind of like mm -hmm. blue collar pick up your lunch pail yeah. you know get on the assembly line or whatever mm -hmm. but then we have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yeah we have Playhouse, Playhouse Square, Square which is the second largest theater district in the country so what is that? What's going on? Because I don't know what the people, obsession is. People don't get like how artistic Northeast Ohio Well, is. that's the reason why I was ever able to think about a career in the arts, I feel like. If it wasn't for like all the artistic outlets, they're not big, grandiose like you find in New York. It's not like a world-breaking, world-record-breaking world theater everywhere you go, but they're definitely an artistic-infused community. Yeah. And I've been sort of involved in a lot of sectors of that. It's definitely vibrant. It's all music based for some it's all music in that sort of thing based the comedy is very hard to find mm. i feel like because i had to hunt i had to hunt for this 
it was all more of like the underground when I just went like randomly just venturing out one night to Euro Gyro and Kent. I like sort of found I was like, hey, there's this whole down seat, this did, comedy thing you want to go to. Did it. you feel like Rabbit off of Eight Mile? Like what was that? Eminem off of Eight Mile? Oh yeah, <laughs> doing the rap battles. <laughs> I felt like an underground bad boy, like, wow, I'm here on this full night. I should be standing up here doing the open mic. Oh, it's the rawest form. No, yeah, it felt like I was, it's this weird thing. But, like, you go to a place like Chicago, New York, it's, like, second nature. Yeah. That's always something that bothered me because, like, I, I my ultimate goal for myself, I want to move to Chicago and do Second City. That's one of my, that's one of my dreams that I have. That's, one, that's something I'm saving up money for currently to do that. But I would totally stay in this area if that was here. There isn't a lot of that here. Like you go to Chicago, you have Annoyance, you have uh, Improv Olympic, you have Second City, you have all that. And then you go to LA, you have like Rowlings, you have UCB, you have UCB in New York. Um, you have all these different outlets for that sort of creativity and thus like a stand up vibe and whatnot. But when you come to Cleveland, you have what we, of uh, uh, what I've been starting to get into just recently. Which is great, but not that the capacity of those area. Yet we have the second largest theater district yeah. in the country. Like that's interesting. You feel like you should have that, like here. Yeah. Like if I do anything with this, like down the line, if I don't end up going around like writing on a TV show like I want to, something I would love to do is go to Second City, train there, get everything I can there, then bring that back to Cleveland. Wow. Because I feel like it should. There's a there's a community for it. And it's like happening in little spurts of areas, but none of it's yeah. really It's not together. coherent. It's not coherent, yeah. which is crazy to me. I'm really glad we're getting this all in recording. Ooh. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's like a sort of a proclamation statement. But like, yeah. no, it should. there should be more stuff here. Like you mentioned, this is a vibrant artistic area. I don't know why there isn't more stuff like this here. It's a very unique area. It doesn't. You, you, nobody thinks that when they think of Cleveland, they think mm -hmm. it, you're there by mistake, mm -hmm. like like something happened that went wrong. It's like a Segway city almost. Are you going to from Cleveland to go somewhere yeah. else? but it's it's so strange. This area, the, the universities, um, the the healthcare mm -hmm. uh, institutions. I mean, the fact that we're like a swing state. We're a swing state. No president has won an election without winning Ohio. And it's it's so weird. Fact. That is fact. Isn't it's it, weird. Isn't it weird? It's very weird. I don't get it. I, I really don't get I, it. I hate and love that I was born in Ohio. Yeah. You know what I mean? I hate yeah. it. I, I hate it because it's like, oh, I could be in other places with actually other stuff happening. But it's quaint enough where I feel like I have some sense of normalcy. But at the same time, I have this outlet where I can go be my artistic self. Yeah. So. That, and, and again, you said that outlet. You you It stemmed from you seeing yourself as a performer. Yes. I see myself as a performer because... I think starting off little, I was somebody who always would act stuff out. Like I remember acting out like Veggie Tail scenes when I was a kid using the toys that I had and stuff. And I think my mom was she was worried that I was going to take that into the real world and not know where it separated. So she put me in theater stuff at the age of like six, like a theater camp. So I know like this is where you go perform and this is where you go do the thing. But I think what ended up happening, all I wanted to do was that other thing. I don't think we understand how powerful it is that we have the capacity to mimic. Mm. in mirror like this idea of playing house yeah right you you see two-year-olds three-year-olds always yeah. doing that well that's something that because i was very socially awkward growing up and i wouldn't be able to read social cues and i just I was always a, the odd guy out i didn't understand people so one thing i always do i i think i always remember this looking back i wouldn't even remember me in certain situations i remember a character that I would like have watched on TV and infusing that and then I was talking to people. That's sort of some of my earliest memories because I think I don't think I had the capacity to understand those sort of like certain cues so I could build them myself. I like put different characters in my own in my own head. So it'd be like if I was watching I can't think of a normal thing. If I was like watching Hey Arnold and I was trying to be the voice of that was trying to be the voice of reason somewhere and put on my Arnold voice, my Arnold hat. And do that. If I was trying to be crazy, I'd just be like my try to be smooth. I put on my Bugs Bunny and be like, um, yeah, you know, this is real yeah. topic. Like it's sort of like a cloak that I would put on just so I could translate to normalcy. But isn't that interesting that we have that capacity to kind oh, of yeah. to kind of put on those filters mm -hmm. of our personality? Yeah, how we like process and make sense of the world. 
and stuff. Like how we just make sense of this thing that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Dude, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. And I keep talking about Pete Holmes, but he's like the one that like started like, he's like voicing the stuff that I've thought in my head for a while. And that's why I've been obsessed with him recently because he's been like, he's been saying the things that I've been like geeking out about this whole time. And I'm just like, oh, you get it. You get sort of the stuff that, that, that I've been sort of struggling with, be it with like religion or like, you know, this sort of like thing of life that he mentioned. It's like, there's no, like, you think about things that are weird. This whole thing that we're doing right now is weird. Yeah, it is. It's strange. Mm -hmm. And, and that's right. It's a miracle. It is. Dude, it's a miracle that people will stand in a line. Yeah. They just do that. What's funny, I work at Jacob's Pavilion uh, and, and I work <laughs> I work uh, as a guest ambassador, and it's really funny. We have multiple lines where people can go into. Um, there's like, if you've ever been there, there's like a whole dock that's like close to like the river that has like a line section. There's a whole main pavilion. There's a little section on the side. Um, everyone goes into the three section, the whole th three or four sections in the middle. Barely anybody goes to the one on the side. And I have to keep reminding people, hey, you can go into this side. People are so used to going to like the ordinary or so like what is like right in front of them trying to conform to that. They don't even see that whole other line. So, and I just think it's funny. And I talk about some of my coworkers. It's funny how people will just go with like that flow. And sort of how our brain is just like, oh, this is just the way to go. People are going this way, we're going this way. And you see a whole other line. Like, you can go this way. And I'm, I'm telling people, and they're going this way, and they're just going, they're like, oh, oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I guess I can go this way. And some people don't even do it. They're just like, oh, that's weird. That's I mean, it, that's, that is like a microcosm of mm -hmm. life. Yeah, it just, it's just a little how we're all weird nuances. And, and that sort of makes me feel better about wanting to do stand-up because, like, if everything's weird, then nothing is weird. Yes. You know? I'm, like, sort of, like, dissolving the word weird in my head because, like, what, what is weird? Yeah. Like, I'm just, it, it's just the choices that yeah. I'm making currently. The whole thing is weird. And I, what I've realized, I think I've said this on the podcast before, you know, like when I talk to my wife about this mm -hmm. or um, other, other people uh, hear me say, XYZ is weird, they automatically automatically equate that with bad. Oh yeah, no, weird. And I, I always have to preface, I'm not saying it's a bad thing that we get get into lines. Mm -hmm. I'm saying it's amazing and I'm thankful that yeah. we get into lines, but it's weird that we have been able to cooperate at a level where hundreds and tens of thousands of strangers Yeah can cooperate <laughs> and go in a single file. Right. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. All these different perceptions of the, the world, all these right. different backgrounds, all these different life uh, situations. Like we accept we have these like glass, these glass things close to our eyes so we can see. Like that's rational. Like that is something so, we've accepted. But, but we have cloth on, we, we wear cloths on our, yeah. on our bodies and that's what we consider clothes. Not boxes. We could have chosen anything. We could have chosen boxes. We could have chosen just like, <laughs> that's hilarious. Like we could have just chosen little wooden yeah. suits to walk around. But no, we chose cloth, and we're all just like, okay, this is cloth. We get it. Yeah. So one of the things that you said, you you had used the word rational, mm -hmm. and I feel like uh, I, I'm blown away by all the scientific revolutions that we have learned. And that we would continue to learn mm -hmm. and learn more and more about all the unknowns. Can you understand me real quick? Are you able to understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I feel like sometimes I get really mush mouthy. I'm just like riffing a little bit from there. You could tell No, yeah. Me. I understand it. Okay, tight. Um, but it was like, it's, we're kind of pseudo rational people, mm -hmm. right? In the sense of, we look at ourselves as enlightened and scientific mm -hmm. and practical. But can you give me an answer in light of that yeah. as to why you think that you can't kill me? I think, we, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you're you physically bigger than me, right? Mm -hmm. You you can physically kill me. That's the you thing. You can't kill me. In my but... head, in my head, everyone is the same height as me. <laughs> I, I swear, everyone's the same height as me in my head. I'm 6'2". <laughs> And everybody, when I think back in conversations, are at my level. That's so funny. But when I look at pictures, <laughs> I'm a giant. 
I don't realize how big I am until I'm looking at a picture, like in a mirror, I'm like, ugh. I'm like, not even just like physically tall. I'm like long and I have like broad shoulders. I'm just a massive entity and I don't realize it until I see myself outside of my head. Yeah, but like uh, another example is um, I, I got hit by someone who ran a red light in like April. Okay. And we did a podcast at the scene of the crime. Thankfully. Oh really? Yeah. They, 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 wow, that's not, amazing. Not, not me, the guy. Not the guy who hit me. Oh, I got so confused. Yeah, I was like, "Let's you guys set this up." Listen, so what's going on, man? I was just driving down. Should I get you here? What, what the heck's going on? You got beef? No, it was me and my passenger, uh, Mike Ivy, who's also a comedian. But um, so like that's an example of like, and I always t- talk about this. Is like it made me realize that um. There's people that believe that you can't run a red light, mm. but you can run a, <laughs> run that's a how red light, like, right? That's how I start rationalizing but, this like to kids, because I have a three-year-old niece, and like of course I wouldn't be, you know, part, she got to ask me questions one day, and I've thought about what she was going to ask me, and it's like, and, I, and I've also taught kids before, and, and it's sort of like, well, why can't I do this? And it's sort of like rationalization of decision making, I was thinking about this like this morning, I think, I was like, well, you can do whatever you want, technically. There are consequences to whatever you do because, yeah. like, we get sort of the sort of like the the approval disapproval sort of thing. This is an like old improv thing. I don't know if you're familiar with Bella Spolin. No. Bella Spolin is a is a theater performer, and theater teacher. She taught. Uh, that's sort of where the base of improv and all of like what sketch comedy we know today originated from. Because she used it as a way to train actors to get outside of their heads and out of their bodies. And she talked about this thing called approval disapproval, where um, when we are teaching the kids. They don't actually learn based off wanting the urge to learn. They, they learn based off wanting to, to get the approval of the teacher wow. and avoid the disapproval of the teacher. Wow. So that's why when you go to improv, it's yes and, and there's no bad choices. Viola? Viola Spolin. Spolin. I was just, listen, I'm really exposing how big of a nerd I am today. I, I learned about this for a while. There's a book called Improv Nation that talks about the, the, the improv in our culture as an American art form the beginning of the 1950s where she introduced this subject to the origins of Second City, then to the origins of I.O., all the way up to SNL and all the other, um, Lonely Island and all the other stuff we have today, originating from that sort of principle. It's called improvisation from the theater. And it sort of all originates from that uh, idea of just like getting out of your body and in theater that anybody can do. You pull somebody off the street, anybody can improvise. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's powerful. It is. And that's, and that's sort of why I want to go to Chicago, because that's the theater I can get behind. That's the, yeah. in addition to stand-up, that's the thing that I can see myself doing, and that's where I fit in. That's awesome, right? But, but sorry, you were saying something before, and I went on a tangent. Oh, uh, about, yeah, so people think that they can't run mm-hmm. a red oh, yeah. light, mm-hmm. but you physically can. You physically can. Run, run a red light. And I'm thankful that most people believe that you can. Yeah. And it's a miracle. It's a miracle, all the intersections. The fact that so many things work well in our society. Like the fact that no one's come in this room yet. May I have your attention, please? What? The library will close in 20 minutes. Perfect. Please make final selections now. Where? What Thank time you. is it? I thought this closes at 6. It's 5.40. Cool. We've been recording for what? Oh. Okay, we're about we're about at an hour. Oh, really? Uh, we're at fifty-seven minutes. You know what? Just real quick, this is a real re- re- detour. You know what I've always wanted to do? You know how like some bars when they're closing, they play closing time. You know when you go to a bar and they play like some closing time. I've never heard that. Oh, there's like some bars that do it. Some people might know it's like the I know who I want to take me home, and they play at the end of the bars. I want people to get out. Okay. I want to play that song halfway through the night at like 11.30 and see who all leaves. At the bar? At the bar. Because mm. people, I believe, have conditioned that song in their heads to mean it's time to go. Because who plays closing hour before you're going to go? And it goes oh. back to that sort of thing you're talking about. That's like, very interesting. I want to like do it, if I ever like run a bar, not that I ever will, but if I ever do, I want to play closing time at 11.30 and see who all's going to leave. Like, well, but I guess it's closed. And just because they know that song as it being a song what you leave to, not a song you mm-hmm. dance to. Mm. Okay, I think I might have heard it before. That's something that just that. that I think really by that me. point, 
I'm not, I can't remember things. Yeah, like, you're just, it, that's something that like, people are drunk crazy and be like, closing time is like, hey, you gotta do this and get some food or something. You gotta be on a party. Well, man, this has been great. Um, oh, I love this. This is, we'll have to do this again. We'll have to do it like on a Saturday mm -hmm. before closing. Yes. So that way we can go longer. No, for sure. Because we both work during the day and stuff. Yeah. Uh, this is, I love that we recorded this conversation. Yeah, man. There's a lot of good nuggets in here. Mm -hmm. When do you release usually? Um, I usually drop on Thursdays. Okay. So then it will be next Thursday. You're going to have to edit this, I know, because I, I peak a lot. Oh, well, I'll just compress it. Okay, because my voice, I like going from like talking like this, and I'm going like, oh my god! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so like that, oh yes, you look at that, you got the That's so funny. Yeah, so let me know when this drops. The computer's blinking. <laughs> okay. Um Yeah, the right. session's about to end, so we should Wh probably wrap yeah. up. Where can people find you? Uh I have a Twitter at Casually Formal Nine. Uh my my Instagram is Casually Formal Guy twenty nineteen. Um those are my two big outlets. Cool. Yeah, and you can find me in the area. I know I already, be, I already have done it. I do, I do uh, sets at Funny Stop, Cheese and Chong's, Water Street Tavern, uh, Euro Gyro, um, if you want. You know, I'll usually post it. I'm starting to post about it more, so cool. I'll also post where I'm going to be. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We'll have to do this again. I would love soon. to. Cool. Thank you. All right. <laughs> we almost made it all the way without dropping.